it's we keep wondering how long do we we go on as we are and um, we know right now we'll go on through the end of August the way we are so out on the podium in the foyer is um, if you need a breakdown of what services are between now and the end of August it's out there same one that's been laying out there for a couple of weeks but uh, those are there if you would like to have one uh, also on the podium in the foyer is a basket and in that basket there's already some cards there for Miss Helen Harper uh, those are for her birthday. She will turn 99 on August 4th. That is a week from Tuesday. And uh, if you could have them here by next Sunday, which will be August 2nd, then we'll make sure that they, they get delivered uh, to her prior to her birthday. Um, the address, I do have that. If you would rather just mail it direct, uh, you can do that. The address is 500 Camp Road, room 103. If you would like to mail it direct, you can do it. Otherwise, you can bring it here. We'll get it to them. Uh, tonight at 6 o'clock, I do want to mention that our, our Sunday school classes are all meeting, uh, have for a couple of weeks now, and we are all meeting. The schedule that's out on the podium in the foyer has the location for each Sunday school class. If you're wondering about where it would be or you can ask me, I'll be glad to, to share that with you as well. And then our Wednesday Bible studies are going on. We have the 10 o'clock Bible study uh, and then also the 7 o'clock uh, Bible study, which we have classes for all ages in that want to mention this coming Saturday is the Arkansas State Free Will Baptist meeting. Typically we have that in May and uh, because of the virus situation it got postponed. We've scaled it back. Uh, we're trying to do everything in about two hours just so we don't have a lot of people having to spend the night or stay uh, out of their normal uh, routine or, or location. So we will be meeting in Little Rock Saturday morning. We do ask that you would uh, keep that in your prayer. We do have a, a, a new moderator this year, so a lot of things are changing. Please remember him in prayer, if you would, as uh, he goes through this new time. Also, World Missions Offering, which typically is in May, or April, April, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, World Missions Offering. We will be having that August the 30th, and we have set a church goal of $10,000, which is what we've had in the past as well, and everything that's given on August 30th, unless you designate it, will actually go toward World Missions Offering. Now, if you designate it, just write on there what you'd like it to go for, and it'll go, it'll go to that. But if you do not designate it, then it will go to World Missions Offering. So we have a goal of 10000 We would encourage you to pray about what God would lead you to give in that situation. Um, it did speak to... Uh, World Missions, the, the uh, representative this last week, and uh, they finished last year in, in actually good shape. They had two missionaries that accounts were in the red. They were able to, to cover those in order to get them out of the red, but this year's giving is not taken off like last year did. So um, if you would, we want to keep our missionaries on the field and, and even expand, Lord willing. So uh, if you would, just pray about what God would have you to do there. The backpack to school distribution that's happening. Now, this is not our backpack program that we collect food for. This is the backpack with supplies in it. That distribution will happen this coming Saturday, August 1st. It will be on the parking lot of Westridge. Uh, our church, as in years past, has been asked to supply the competition <laughs> composition notebooks. And uh, so we have just went to Walmart and got Walmart to order all of those for us. Uh, we've done that, I believe, last year as well. This year, with the, the way the situation is, we just felt it was easier to do. Some of you have liked to contribute to that in the past. If you would like to, you can just designate on your check or put money in an envelope and designate it and just put composition notebooks or backpack uh, program, and we will, we will use it toward that. But uh, that is going on, and, and they are very appreciative of what the church does. So thank you as a church for being willing to support those things. Uh, any questions uh, concerning church or announcements or anything going on that I might have missed? Okay, I have a card that I want to share with you, and it's from the, the McDowell family. And it says, we want to start off by saying, if people don't have a church family, they are truly missing out. Sutton Free Will Baptist is the best. Thank you for your faithful prayers for James' salvation and through his long illness. You all were always just a call or text away for our needs many times. Then you all wrapped your arms around us during his homegoing or home, homecoming. 
We praise Jesus for answered prayers. James is healed. We appreciate your love and friendship to us. Love you all, the McDowell family. And it says, we covet your prayers to please continue during this season of first for our family. And uh, to them, we, we say you are in our prayers. And, and um, we have a lot going on with Jolie's surgery and, and a lot of change. But um, let's remember them as well as others in prayer also. Anything else before we get into our service this morning? All right, I want to um, turn your attention then to uh, the last half of the Ten Commandments. And the last half of the Ten Commandments, if you've ever paid attention, Ten Commandments are somewhat broken into two different areas. The first part is speaking of our love toward God and how we are to love Him above all else. We are not to have idols. We are not to covet other things. And then the last half of the Ten Commandments actually speaks to how we are to love or interact with our brother and sister here on earth. It is that second part that we want to focus on today. And we, we refer to it many times as loving our neighbors ourself. And we find that in the New Testament given to us. But as we think about, and our text will come from Luke chapter 10, if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles there. I'm not going to read from there right now, but if you want to open them, lay them aside. Our text will come from there, which is the, the story or the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in that parable, uh, things are, individuals are challenged upon how we are to love people and who our neighbor is. And I want us to think about that not only today, but I want us to think about that text as we go throughout this coming week. And our love for our neighbor should shine through. If we truly love God, we proclaim to be a Christian. If we truly love him, if he, Christ has filled our heart, then our love for people should show through. And that neighbor should not be a question of who is our neighbor, but we should just accept all being our neighbor. So let's, uh, let's keep that in mind as Brother Delbert comes at this time to lead us in our music for this morning. Can you imagine what kind of world this would be if, if we loved everybody like we love ourselves? You know, most of us love ourselves pretty good. <clears throat> Probably we're going to sing uh, Standing on the Promises. <clears throat> Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on
lifted me. Oh, how I love Jesus. Sing all four verses and uh, stand on the fourth verse. Thank you. 
Morgan, would you lead us in prayer, please? It's a wonderful song that we sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. It, uh, we proclaim it. Um, sometimes we have to wonder how do we truly show that? How do we show that we love Jesus? And we want to talk about that some today as we go throughout our text. Again, Luke chapter 10, verse 25 is where we'll begin. Some of you may remember uh, when you were younger that some buildings were heated with radiators and there was a big uh, boiler that would heat water make steam and then that steam would circulate through the radiators that were within the room and uh, it would be heated some of you may be too young to know what I'm even talking about with that when I was in high school our high school building was pretty old and we still had those radiators and every once in a while if class got real boring someone would go over and kind of knock off the valve that was kind of the pop-off release valve and we'd have steam blowing through the room and not that I ever done that but some people did and uh, they shouldn't have done that but they did but but anyway it, it, those uh, those things it, I remember the first time that I got to go down and actually see the boiler and it was a big tank they actually had it uh, kind of in a basement below ground and it was um, above or below where the library was I'm not sure why they chose to put it there but they did so I went down and saw the tank, and I noticed that on the side there was this clear tube, kind of a cylinder-looking tube, and it was an inspection window to be able to see what the level of the water was that was within that big tank. Now that was really important because they didn't want the water to get too low, they didn't want it to get too high, had to be just right in order for things to work well, all the rooms to be heated and everyone to be happy. Now, we have an indicator that lets God know how full of Him we are in our heart. And that indicator is our love for one another. Love for our brothers and sisters is proof positive or proof negative of our love or lack of love for God. As we look to Luke chapter 10, we find a familiar event of Jesus teaching a lawyer about loving uh, and, and about loving our neighbor as ourself, but not just teaching the lawyer, as he was also teaching his apostles that were gathered. And I want you to remember something that James and John done back in chapter 9 of Luke. And we find in chapter 9, if you go back there, that James and John had asked Christ when they had left a Samaritan village if he wanted them to call fire down from heaven and destroy them. Now, Jesus moved on past that. But I just want you to keep that in mind as we read the events of the story here. So let's look at verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. It says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he, said to two, and he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, 
came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Now as the lawyer tries to somewhat justify his actions by asking this question, just who is my neighbor, he probably thought that this instruction of loving one's neighbor as yourself had to be restricted to just the Jewish brethren, as he was a Jew. He may have thought, we can't love everyone, that's impossible. So where do we draw the line? Do we love blasphemers? Do we love trouble causers? And the list could go on and on of, of where he might have wondered the line might be drawn. Now we might today have the same question. Where do we draw the line? What about child molesters? What about murderers? What about those who steal and rob? What about those that continues to do us wrong, not just once, but they continue to do us wrong? What about thieves of the world? Where do we draw the line, or do we draw a line? Jesus answers these questions for us by telling the story of the Good Samaritan. And he talks about three individuals first. And, and a lot of this was for this individual, this lawyer's or this Levite's um, instruction in his own life. But much of it is for us today as well. The priest is the first individual that Jesus talks about other than the man who has been robbed. And he discovers the man first, and he was likely returning from the temple after having worked in the temple as being a priest. And, and he was probably on a, in a hurry to get home. And he knew that if he would touch, if this man was dead and he would touch him, then it would make him unclean. And so the original, if you go back and read the original language and the intent of the original language, you find that it actually says that he not only passed by him, but he went all the way around him, like as far as he could go from him, because he did not want to come close to him. He did not want to risk being unclean, so he passed by what I'm going to term on the far side of the road. Just to put this in perspective, he was more worried about preserving his cleanliness than about the entire second half of the Ten Commandments, which speaks of loving our brother and sister. It makes us call into question in our own lives. And you've heard me say that when we get involved in ministry in some way or we try to help someone in life, then sometimes it gets messy. It gets dirty. We, we have to, to get somewhat, to use a term, get in the trenches in order to be able to help them. Sometimes that causes us to become what we might term here unclean. Are we willing to become unclean to help someone? Or are we more concerned about our cleanliness than we are about helping someone else? You see, that is the epitome of selfishness. It's not loving our neighbor as ourself. It's loving ourself. As Brother Delbert said earlier, sometimes we do a good job of loving ourselves. So this priest had a hard time of looking past what he thought probably was what he was supposed to do. You might remember someone else in New Testament. Paul or Saul prior to his conversion and name change. And Saul thought that he was sent by God to persecute Christians, to wipe them out. And he thought he was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. And yet he had never stopped and listened and compared what Christ was preaching to Old Testament prophecy. And so Paul finds on the road to Damascus that he as he is approached by Christ, he finds out that what he was doing was wrong. 
You see, sometimes we have these moments in our life where, where we're doing what we think is right. We're doing what we think God wants us to do, and yet we look in the mirror and we see that we've got this all wrong. And it's in that moment in time, in that specific instance, that we have to make a choice. Now, Paul had to make a choice as well. This priest had to make a choice. Does he love the man, help him, or does he take care of self? And we see in the, the event that Jesus tells that the priest was more concerned about caring for himself. And I hope that's not where we would find ourselves. And if it is, may today be a day that we change that in our own life. The second individual that we see is a Levite. And he was not as high ranking as the priest was, yet he was still very privileged in that Jewish community, meaning that he still had a lot of responsibility. Now the priest may have thought because of his responsibility, he did not need to come, become unclean. This Levite would have had that, could have had that same line of thought if he wanted. Levite would oversee all the services in the temple, and he could possibly say, you know, if, if I become unclean, then who's going to do what I do? And by the time Jesus had gotten this far in the story, everyone was probably expecting him to say that the third person would actually be an Israelite layperson, a common Jewish man. Because there was some... Uh, animosity between the common Jewish person and the religious leader. And so many would have thought, listening to the story for the first time, many would have thought that Jesus was now going to address the difference between the religious authority and the common person. But that's not the direction that Christ goes. People were expecting Jesus to say that a common everyday Jewish guy was better than the priest and the Levite because he would have stopped and helped. And this would have upset the religious leaders, but would have made many of the common people very happy as they sometimes were looked down upon. But again, the third person that we find is not this common Jewish person. It's a Samaritan. And I want you to remember back, as we said earlier, to chapter 9, where James and John were ready to call fire down from heaven to consume the Samaritan village that had rejected Christ. Now, James and John were both Jewish people. Therefore, they had this animosity between them and the Samaritans. Samaritan was not a guy that was welcomed by Jewish culture. And if you go back to history to see what the real deal about this was in, in brief, you go back into Old Testament times, there was a time where the Israelites became captives by the Assyrians. The Assyrians then had a portion of the Israelites that intermarried with the Assyrians and they became what Jewish people would term them in that day and time. They became half-breeds. They were half-Jewish and half-Gentile. Because of that, the Jewish people felt that they were hypocrites or heathen, and therefore would not associate them. Jewish rabbis even instructed that no man shall eat the bread of the Samaritans. For he who eats their bread is as he who eats swine's flesh. Now if you know anything about Jewish history, they did not eat pork of any kind. Many Jewish prayers even ended in, in this statement, and do not remember the Samaritans in the resurrection. They actually prayed that the Samaritans would not be remembered by Christ in the resurrection. This is the, the love-hate or actually hate relationship that they had. Now there's a possibility even that this Jewish traveler that was injured, the one who had been robbed and beaten, if he was not half dead and unconscious, then there is a possibility that being a Jew, he might have refused the help from the Samaritan. Now, we don't know that that happened. That wasn't what Jesus was trying to talk about here. But we must understand that that was the relationship between the two individuals. 
priest and Levite would have recited every morning and every night what they termed the Shema, which included the command to love God with the totality of one's being. Everything about them, heart, soul, mind, breath, everything about them was to love God. Every morning, not just Sundays, not just Wednesdays, not just Saturdays, every morning they would get up and they would recite that, speaking of their love for God. Every evening before they went to bed, they would recite that, speaking of their love for God. And yet right in the middle of this, for this priest and Levi, in the middle of them declaring their love for God in the morning and declaring their love for God at night, in the middle of that is this Samaritan or this individual who needs help. I'm sorry, Jewish guy who needs help. And they're proclaiming first thing that morning, we love God with all of our being. They're proclaiming at night, we love God with all of our being. And in the middle of the day, we're walking around the guy that needs our help. How is that proclaiming our love for God? Are we being honest with ourselves in the mornings and in the evenings? You see, sometimes we may fall victim to the very same thing that we're reading about and studying about here. That we proclaim we love God with all of our life, but yet we walk around the individual that actually needs the help. Do we talk of our love for God and love for our fellow man and then walk right by him? Many may wear a cross around their neck or have a Jesus bumper sticker on their car, which is a reminder to us and a message to the world that we love God. And it should also be a message to the world that we love our neighbor as ourself. You see, we wear that. I don't. Just to be clear, I don't wear a necklace, by the way. But Some of you wear that. Some of you proclaim that. Some of you may have the bumper sticker or the T-shirt, whatever it may be. Remember a few years ago, we actually went, uh, family went to Disney World on a trip. And at that time, we were at the, the church in Jonesboro, and, and the church had had some T-shirts made, and we had a Bible verse on the back, and, and the church name was on the front. And, and we, uh, uh, some of us wore the, the shirts a couple times, you know, throughout the week. And we actually had several individuals that stopped and commented and said, you know, we like your shirt. I didn't think too much about it then. But when I was studying for this, I did. And whenever we don something that proclaims that we are a Christian, then we really need to act the part. And if we don't, then what are we proclaiming? Sometimes we don the necklace or the shirt or the bumper sticker, and it's a reminder, should be a reminder for us, but yet we may fail to love our neighbor, which then means that we've really failed to love God. You see, the Samaritan showed that he loved God by loving the person that society would tell him to despise. And if we claim to have Christ in our hearts, then we must be loving and merciful to our neighbors, those we meet along the road of life, no matter what that road is. You know, Barney one time was explaining to Otis, or no, I think it was, uh, actually I got that wrong this morning, he was explaining to Gomer about different roads of life. Gomer was about to go on a date with someone. I said it wrong. I can't believe I got an Andy Griffith reference wrong this morning. But he's explaining to Gomer about how, you know, we go down different roads of life. Some of them are hilly, some are rocky, some are paved roads, some are highways. But when we think about it in our own personal life, we go down different roads, but there are people that God sends in our path that go down many different roads. And we got to be willing to get dusty sometimes. And if we're not, then are we truly loving God? let alone loving our neighbor as ourselves. See, our relationship with our fellow human beings either validates or invalidates our claims to know and to love God. 
Now, it's not a call to be perfect, but it's a call to consider whether in our relationships there is evidence that we love God. Do we show that we love God by the way we treat our spouse? Do we show that we love God by the way we treat our coworkers? Do we show that we love God by the way we treat our children or our parents or other people's children or other people's parents? Do we show that we love God by the way we treat or speak about those who are in authority over us? See, it doesn't mean that we have to agree with everything that they do, but Romans 13 tells us that we are to respect those who are in authority over us. Do we show that we respect them by the way that we speak about them? And maybe in today's day and time, do we show that we respect those who agree with those who are in authority over us? Do we forgive others? Or do we hold a grudge so hard that we just can't let go? And therefore, it prevents us from helping in some way. Some years ago, several years ago now, there was a CBS anchorman and reporter by the name of Hugh Rudd. And Mr. Rudd was actually mugged outside his New York City apartment complex one evening, and he lay conscious, his eyes open but unable to move. He couldn't speak. He could mumble, but he couldn't speak. He had been beat up pretty good. He could moan and mumble, and, and, but he was quite aware of all that was going on around him, but he couldn't move. He couldn't get help for himself. Mr. Rudd lay there from 2.30 until dawn, some four, at least four hours, five hours. There were people that were returning from watching the theater that walked right past him and entered the building. The milkman, back when we actually had milkmen, the milkman came and left, set the milk down, walked right by him, didn't help in any way. No one even stopped to see what was wrong, and yet he was conscious enough to know this, but not strong enough to be able to help himself. Despite his pathetic attempts to ask for help, no one helped. And I tell you that to say, this story that Jesus told, this parable that Jesus told, is not just something he made up. It really happens. And it really happens in our world today. And if not cautious, when we fail to show our love for our neighbor, then we find ourselves, even though we're proclaiming God, we're teaching the world that God really doesn't love His creation. I wonder how many we see that is in the shape of Mr. Rudd or the shape of this Jewish man that we choose to criticize instead of assist or help. I wonder how many we say, man, they must have really done something to get themselves in that shape. Or how many looked at Mr. Rudd and said, you know, it's just a drunk laying here on the street. We just need to leave him alone. But in our own life, how many that look like us, talk like us, act like us, do we walk by every day that really need to see the love from their neighbor, and yet we don't? Or how many don't look like us, have chosen to make some terrible decisions in their life, Maybe they're from a different country, different nationality. Maybe they speak a different language. Maybe it's broken English. How many of them walk by us every day and they need to see our love for God through loving them and yet we don't? And instead, we choose to criticize instead of assist. I will tell you, it is a whole lot easier to criticize than it is to assist. You don't get dusty when you criticize, at least initially. You get really hot later, though, by the way. I'm talking about eternity.
And I say that somewhat jokingly, but reality is we can't sit back and criticize everyone and expect God to just accept us with open arms and offer no assistance or no help. Which of these actions speaks of our love for God? Criticizing or assisting? And has your love for someone cost you anything? I want to take you back to the story. We don't talk too much about the guy, the Samaritan that actually helped, and just the inner, inner workings of, of what he had to do. But if you'll notice, he stopped and he bandaged him. The text says that. Now, there's a good chance that he didn't carry bandages with him, which means he had to find some cloth some, from somewhere, which probably meant that he tore his own clothing in order to have bandages to fix the guy, or to, to bandage the guy up. He used his oil and his wine to try to care for him, and then he placed him on his animal. And we don't know how far they were from the next village or from the place that he took him, the inn, but apparently there was some distance. He placed him on his animal, which means that he had to walk instead of ride as he was. And then he gets to the inn and he cares for the guy that evening. He doesn't just walk up to the innkeeper and say, hey, here he's yours. But he cares for the guy that evening. And it says the next day he gives the innkeeper two denarii. Two denarii was two days wages, approximately. And it would actually feed an individual for approximately 20 to 21 days. And he promised the innkeeper that he'd pay him what else he owed him when he came back. You see, sometimes I say this to tell you that sometimes loving our neighbor cost us something. Sometimes it's hard for us to, to enjoy that cost. But has our love for someone cost us anything? Or have we always been on the receiving end of that love? And if it's not cost us anything, then I believe we must stand in the mirror and ask the question, have we truly loved those in need? Would you stand with me for a word of prayer? Dearly Father, we do come to you today. And Lord, as we stand in your presence, Lord, as your Holy Spirit works in our life even now, Lord, we ask that, that as we stand in front of that mirror now, Lord, that you would open our eyes, our ears, and our heart to the message maybe that we need to hear from today. And Lord, we pray that if in some way we failed to be what you've called us to be, lovers of you and lovers of our neighbor, then Lord, help us to see that. Help us to change. Lord, convict us if we are unable to see it right now. And Lord, help us portray to the world the message that you love your creation, you've sent your Son to die for that creation, and that you desire that all would accept him as their personal Savior. Help us to proclaim that through our actions toward others. We thank you for this time, even now. And Lord, we thank you for your grace. And Lord, if there be one here today who has not asked you to be their Savior, has not professed you, Lord, we pray that today they make that decision so that they too can truly understand your love for them and, and also begin showing that to others. Lord, help us as we depart from here to, to be that witness that you've called us to be. And we pray these things in your Son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. As we prepare to depart from here, I did ask you earlier in the service if you would not only think about what we're talking about today, 
but think about this throughout your week as we interact with others, as we talk about our world is in crazy times right now. Uh, let's not join the craziness, but let's show love toward others in the way that Christ would want us to, in every way that we interact. We appreciate you being here. I'm going to be here at the front. If you would like to, to talk about anything, if you'd like for me to pray with you about anything, you can catch me after service or you can catch me at any time throughout the week. Uh, feel free to give me a call. Uh, we would love to visit with you in any way. Have a wonderful afternoon and uh, enjoy your rest of the day. But let's make sure that we show that love toward God by showing our love toward our neighbor. We love you guys. Y'all are dismissed from Steve. If you would start us off.